moment, especially after COVID-19, things are changing and job market is getting very, very bad. But there is still hope. And uh, when you actually connect to industry experts and get in know what's in demand, that's always better. In continuity of actually efforts to bring in industrial experts. So we have very, very special guest today, Rashab. He is joining us from US and he's working as a director in Phoenix Contact. I want to hear more about you, actually, Arshaw, from you, and our audience would love to know more about you. Over to you. All right. Well, great. Well, thanks for having me on the on the show here. I mean, this is uh, this is great. It's uh, it's fantastic to uh, to really you know talk and 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 be part of this community. So. As was mentioned, my name is Ira Sharp. Um, I'm from the U.S. I'm actually from the uh, the eastern part of the U.S. in Pennsylvania. And as I mentioned, it's 8 a.m. here. So you know, while you many of you I know are, are winding down your day and entering to the weekend, I have my big big coffee here, and um, I'm ready uh, ready for the morning. But as my background, I've actually been with Phoenix Contact for uh, for 15 years, and in that 15 years. I've I've held many different positions at Phoenix Contact, including things like um, in, in wireless communications. Uh, I've I've dealt with uh, network infrastructure, cybersecurity. Uh, I've dealt with uh, all different types of, of safety applications, process automation systems, a variety of different types of things across the United States. And uh, in in that experience, if, you, if if you're not aware of what Phoenix Contact is. Um, Phoenix Contact is a component supplier uh, for industrial applications. It's actually a multi-billion dollar company. And pretty much anything that goes inside of a control cabinet, they make. So with that, we service all different types of industries, from factory automation to process automation, from end users to OEMs, the system integrators, and beyond, right, and machine builders. And so with that, with my experiences, I've, I've traveled across the U.S. I've seen everything from Semicon to uh, pharma to water, wastewater to factory automation. And I've dealt with a variety of different types of automation systems. And I think right now is a really interesting time and place because there's so much that's changing in the industry. Uh, it's really at this pivotal point and uh, there's a lot more need for this data and there's transformations happening. And I think particularly for people that are getting started and becoming educated, the the new entrance to the market, to the to the engineering market, are really going to to drive how we can do more with data and applications and these kind of things in the industry um, and really evolving things. And I think we'll get into some of those topics here later on today. Great, great. So what do you think about for most and for you know, first thing we are going to talk about that's what's what is industry 4.0, and why we are actually why it's needed to actually accept it at the moment, and we have no choice other uh, no other choice left. Yeah, please yeah. talk about industry 4.0 and explain in your words. And I I know we had earlier sessions on the same topic, but getting in your views would be really really important. Yeah, so um, I actually have a slide here, and uh, and I'll um, I'll put this up. But what Industry 4.0 is is it's um, it's it's really it, it's a, it's a big topic, and it's a big topic because um, it can be sliced and diced in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of different buzz out there. There's lots of different opinions on on what it actually means. And what you're seeing on the screen here is a typical factory environment. Well, maybe not super typical, but a factory environment. And there's lots of different applications, lots of different systems. There's lots of different things that are going on, right? Everything from shuttles moving around on the floor to a dark warehouse in the upper right-hand corner there to uh, different types of presses and, and, and other things going on. And you see the bubbles, you see the little lines moving around. And all those lines represent data movement. There's all kinds of data that's happening in industrial facilities, whether it's factory automation, process automation, doesn't really matter. Data is moving on the factory floor. And in a lot of cases, and you can see it with the different colors there, there's different silos of information. And those silos of information um, make it challenging for some of the systems to interact. So the idea of Industry 4.0 
is to get all of this data to a central uniform place, uh, some sort of local namespace, right? So you can get all the information to one particular area. And once the data is in that area, whether it be local or remote, um, then you can use that to do all different types of things with it. And you can really make it available to different and production systems, you could send it to uh, CRMs, ERPs, you could send it to uh, whatever it may be, but you can have different subscribers to the information that they actually need. Uh, some of the key things there are you don't want to ne necessarily make uh, preconceived notions about what somebody wants to do with data. You want to provide all of the data and let the necessary people get the information that they need. So it's important to combine all these things together into one common area. And a lot of cases, this is called like the digital twin or a digital twin is maybe a subset of that. So if you look at it here, uh, you would have something like a local namespace where you can get all this information. And the idea here is this is the real time information of everything that's going on in an environment. And then that can be then posted up to a higher level system, because if it's a factory or an application that has multiple sites, you could have the same operation in multiple sites across the world. And then you can get all the information to one central area where then you can subscribe out to, to whatever it may be that you want to be looking for. Downtime, um, predictive maintenance, uh, getting an understanding of what your materials are so you can do the proper ordering, what the inlet, in, inbound orders are. It's this overall digital transformation that's happening in the industry. So hopefully that answers your question for you. Are you there? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I think uh, I got uh, disconnected for a while, but yeah, I'm there. So my question is like, uh, how much it is important for anybody to actually grab an industry 4.0 related in information for anybody who wanted to get into even automation? Like, is it necessary for automation guys to be aware about industry 4.0? Like those who are actually working on as an instrument engineer, maybe electrical or mechanical, how much it is important for everybody to have at least understanding about Industry 4.0? Well, I would say that it's uh, extremely important for everybody to have an understanding of Industry 4.0. Is it required? No, but you're going to be much better suited for the future, much better suited to help um, drive your company that you're working for to the next step to become more efficient and do better things with the resources, the time, and these types of things in their applications. So um, really having that baseline can only help you. If you don't have it, can you do standard operations in a, in a, in a facility? Absolutely. None of those things are going away. We still need to maintain operations. We still need to maintain things. We still need to, to fix things when they're down. Uh, we still need operators to, to really run the entire system. There's nothing that changes there. The difference is if you understand Industry 4.0 and you believe in Industry 4.0, it can really help. Now, it's important to understand that just because you understand it doesn't mean that the company is going to make the transformation. This has to be a culture shift that happens within the organization. Um, and you can subscribe to that whenever the company does do that. And that, in my opinion, for someone that's kind of coming up and trying to figure out where they need to go, in this industry is what's really important because having that baseline, being able to talk in this type of way and, and having that bigger picture view can only help you and help the company you're working for move in this direction. Great. So uh, if you talk about anybody who is just a fresher and want to learn industry, like for example, uh, if somebody was recently graduated, and he have an option to actually select instrumentation, electrical, industry 4.0, and some other respective fields like data science. And what's your opinion from there? They from where they should start with. What's yeah. your opinion about that? Yeah. So what I, mean, I would we say got there. Similar question here also from what, yeah. Where should you start? Um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well. One of, the, one of the big things there is there's a lot of different languages. There's a lot of different things that are going on in the industry. And the, the, the key thing there is 
what you need to really understand is that one of the best ways to do it is to really just get some equipment, take a look at things, um, see how things work together and understand the basics. Because if you understand the basics of, of, of how a process works in terms of like a PLC and how it operates and these kind of things, um, it's going to give you a good baseline for what you're typically going to see in most applications today. Now, tomorrow, what we'll be looking at is how do we move this data around and understanding some core concepts like MQTT or OPCUA, just understanding how they work, how they operate um, is, is going to be a big step in the right direction. And uh, while this will also help you in, in the industry, it can now help you in general just understand how a lot of communication systems work. Because MQTT, for example, is a, is a common protocol used for communicating information um, in a lightweight way across all different types of platforms. And what you see on the screen here is, I think another really important thing is knowing the key ways to communicate information across the platform to get information from point A to point B to help transform something in industry 4.0 is a big step. But the other thing to remember is, I believe strongly that the industry as a whole is changing. And when you look at the way industrial processes have been done for years, it's always been done with PLCs. And typically PLCs are programmed with like ladder logic or using standards IEC 61131, where you get into the structured text and function blocks and all those different kinds of things. And if you're not aware of all those, that's fine. That's the way things have traditionally been done. And it is important to understand those. But what you see on the screen here is a vast array of different types of technologies, different type of languages, different types of systems that are going on right now outside of the industry of industrial, but in every other area. And these are making their way into industrial. There is a, in addition to the 4.0 standpoint of getting data and communicating that to make systems better, there's also an area of open automation that's happening and utilizing open source code, utilizing things like Python to make programming simpler are also big advantages in this industry. The chart that you saw there that was the graph that showed all the different languages going up into the future, you could see that there's been a big change that has happened over a long period of time in the different languages that are accepted. You can leverage these skills in things like industrial applications. And I believe that this will become a more of an in-demand type of thing in the future for industrial automation. Because when you use just standard PLC controls, you can get, you can do great operations. It's specifically designed for a conveyor belt and you're making this particular thing happen over and over again. But what if you want to do some sort of analysis on that product that's coming across that conveyor? Well, there you might need to use MATLAB or use some Python code to do that evaluation because it's too difficult in the standard PLC language. That is going to be a very in-demand type of topic in the future. That's really good. And I, I want to get into the PLC next. And uh, for sure, this is going to be a future. And first of all, uh, can you please explain us about what is actually you guys are offering PLC in the PLC next, which we other brands don't have at the moment, like Siemens, Allen Bradley, which are traditional programming supported PLCs. Yeah. So um, let me get into that here. And um, just to kind of uh, highlight something before I get into the PLC next, you know, I mentioned all those different languages, right? And, and everything that's, I believe that the industry is changing and there's this need for all these higher level types of languages to interact with each other. And it, I have this slide up here because this is an example of something that's happening in industry today. This is something that's happening now. And there's this organization code called OPATH, which is from the open group. And what this is, is this is actually, um, uh, it was an Exxon funded program to take uh, a standard process in one of their facilities for refining um, oil into gas and see if they could do that operation not using a DCS, a distributed control system, which is traditionally used for process automation and using standard COTS products, consumer off the shelf products um, and open source code. So the big reason they wanted to do this is so they weren't beholden to 
one manufacturer for their entire process. So they started this idea of, okay, well, could we do this open source type of integration for for a, a true industrial process, one of the most you know stringent processes that we have in, in, in refining um, oil and gas or in pharma or in, or in some of these high or critical areas um, that could potentially be very hazardous. And, and what they found and what you see on the screen here is the organization that has really embraced this and moved it forward. And it's it's really interesting to see that this is being adopted in, in some of those big names that you see there in pilot projects. This is not running and it's it's not you know, being, a, you know, implemented in every part of every one of these processes today, but all of these companies are integrating a pilot process. And why this is important and why I bring it up is what I showed in the last slide of all those different languages, the key things to know here is this is built on an open system. It's built in, in doing things not in a traditional PLC way. It's not using standard PLC type of coding and things. It's, it's utilizing an open platform that's multi-vendor to allow all these different types of pieces to communicate together. It's in direct relation to what I was already speaking about and where I believe the industry is going. In addition to this, there's a couple of projects that we've dealt with locally where we had an oil and gas integrator that was uh, using a standard PLC, but they needed to communicate to the cloud and their PLC didn't communicate to the cloud. So they in introduced the Raspberry Pi. Well, there's no reason to have two different pieces there. You could use one that does all of it. Um, and that's where PLC Next will come in. But the idea there is they needed to use open source code as well as standard PLC logic. And these two worlds are melding together so that you can have one nice system that does all of this. And you need someone like you that can help program this and bring these fields together. So it's really important there. And another application as a machine builder, they were actually using a Rockwell system. And the Rockwell system was using or working really well for their for a uh, major fast food company that they were using to, to, to make these different processes. Um, but they had some specific code they needed to use to, to, to do some particular uh, manipulation of the materials that they were making. And that was all written in um, Python. So they needed to utilize the Python code within a PLC. A traditional PLC, in that case, it was a Rockwell PLC, it couldn't run the Python code. Um, and they also needed to communicate it to a namespace, like I showed in the first slide. So in doing this, this all enters into where I'm saying these, these worlds are combining and having these skills together is definitely the direction things are going. And something like the PLC Next that we were talking about from Phoenix Contact is a product that can can make this happen. It, it's a product that can can really meld all these technologies together here. And and what you see on the screen here is what PLC Next technology is from Phoenix Contact. So Phoenix Contact is very well known for power supplies, relays, cables, connectors. We make reliable connections from the sensor to the cloud. We do it very well. We've done it for almost a hundred years. And like I said, multi-billion dollar company. We've been involved in the industrial automation space for a very long time, um, many, many years. And now we've introduced a new technology here in PLC Next. And what PLC Next is, is it is a standard PLC, which means it's designed for standard machine and process control. It uses standard IEC 61131. So it has the ladder, it has the structured text, it has the function block programming, and so on. But the unique thing behind it is that it also allows you to have access to the Linux side of the device. And you can also program it using high level languages like, like C and C++. Um, and by offering the capability of programming it on the Linux side, you can take an open source code from GitHub in the case of like that, uh, the, the fast food application that I spoke about, and you can put it on there so you can do the processing of that material outside of the PLC net or PLC world but still use the PLC for the standard machine control operations. So it really pushes those two pieces together, which is really important in the next generation of automation in the industry 4.0. And then the other piece here is that there's a lot of talk about edge. And, and when you look at what PLC Next is, it can certainly live on the edge because it can collect mass amounts of data and it can provide you a direct connection to a cloud or a local cloud 
called a fog in a lot of cases, to collect that data. Or it can live at the IT layer where it can do data collection and it supports things like IT protocols for interfacing with all different types of IT systems while supporting the major industrial protocols like Modbus and Profinet and Ethernet IP and so on. So that's a little bit about what PLC Next is. It's an open control platform that's really designed for the next generation of automation. It provides you that direct access to Linux to, to combine the different capabilities. Um, it provides you capabilities to connect directly to a cloud, whether it be uh, AWS, Azure, Google IoT, Alibaba, whatever, whatever it may be, you can connect all those different cloud systems directly to this platform, or you can communicate to a local cloud. And there's lots of different versions of that, um, that that you can collect all the data locally there. And then finally, in the standard PLC control side of it, you can program it using standard operations, but you can also program it using high level languages, like I mentioned, the C, the C++, even MATLAB can be directly integrated into the real-time side of this device. Wow, that's that's one of the things that actually when I was actually looking into programming initially, so I was thinking because I'm basically a computer engineer, mm -hmm. electric, like electrical specialized with computers, so I, I do have a good hands-on experience with the C and we, we work in our projects and in you know learning when we were in when we were uh, studying in colleges but there when he, when it comes to programming uh, controllers plcs we see a huge difference like we haven't studied that and that was a complete shift and it's good to see that plc next is offering uh, you know support to you know high level languages it supports linux and what I think like that's that's the future of industry, and that's where actually other brands will also get into uh, picture very very soon because it's a very good add-on. So, what's your move towards the DCS? This is a PLC. Are you guys planning to have some DCS to uh, to have same kind of a functionality and same kind of a support? Okay, well, that's a good question. So, from a Phoenix, con per Phoenix contact perspective, you know, where are we going with PLC next? Um, no, there's no plans to necessarily have a DCS system. Now, what I will say is, when I speak about PLC next, it's a technology. It's it's an ecosystem. So, what you see on the screen here is is one of the examples of a controller that we have that runs the PLC Next technology or utilizes the PLC Next technology. But again, this technology can be run on other platforms. So we have uh, higher level controllers so that if you need more operating power, you know, we have different series of control. You can even run this on uh, a PC or an industrial IPC from we have them as well, and that can give you more computing power. And this is why you would want something like that. So um, with this operation here and the way this controller is developed, it has immense amount of processing power and it's really good as an edge device on a typical factory environment. But what if you have a high speed vision system and you need to do analytics on material coming down a line? This product that I'm showing you on the screen right now won't have the processing power to run possibly the MATLAB code that you would need to do that. But we have higher level processors or even high level uh, IPCs, industrial PCs, that utilizing the, the, the PLC Next technology could incorporate all these things that I just spoke about. So it's hardware independent. So while Phoenix Contact is not looking at doing anything as a DCS system, could it be adopted in some other way? Possibly, but it's nothing that Phoenix Contact has on the horizon. Great, so good. Uh, good. I think we have uh, many questions coming up, and I request you guys who are actually watching us right now, you can write your questions. And at the end of this discussion, like after 10 to 15 minutes, we would be definitely getting into your questions. So uh, my next question is, uh, with, with COVID-19 currently, how much you know, you know, you see a rise in getting into industrial digitalization because initially there was a very less acceptance, acceptance level from the customers on industrial digitalization, but how much 
COVID is affecting that. Um, what's your opinion about that? Yeah, so that's that's a good question, and um, I'll give you a very nondescript answer. It depends. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I, I think it's it's had it. COVID nineteen has forced the entire world to move very quickly into the digital era. I don't think anybody would say different that we were going to get to the space that we are today in terms of utilizing Teams and Zoom and all these other things to talk in a regular basis. But industry as a whole, beyond even industrial industry, was slow to adapt to that change because we had massive infrastructure already in place for face-to-face -face communications, lots of brick and mortar, lots of buildings to have conversations. You know, We didn't have to make that jump. It's a jump that we wanted to make. With COVID-19, we had to make that jump. And many companies made a seamless integration into the work from home and digitalization and all of these other types of things that had forced us to become very digital, very fast from a working standpoint. Now, to answer your question about industrial, well, industrial always tends to lag what happens everywhere else for good reason. It's risk averse because you're making materials, you're making things, you're making things that go out the door. And if you're not making those things, you're not paying, you're not uh, making enough revenue to support the entire infrastructure. So this fast forward of maybe five years in our digitalization journey and our personal lives and our work lives has really made a big difference in how that'll be adopted into the industrial space. Now, I will say that if you look at some of the big companies out there, the ones that are really making a move, like, uh, and, and, and come to at least top of my mind, and um, maybe this is a US centric view, but things like Apple and Tesla, and you look at the processes that they have and what they're doing, and they're focusing on manufacturing, they're focused on innovation, and they know they need to really advance in these areas. So it's happening. I think COVID will help open the eyes of manufacturing more than ever before. And then it's now a matter of funding to get these projects off the ground and mm -hmm. understanding the philosophy that it doesn't have to be a rip everything out and replace everything. Um, you can augment what's already in a factory, but you need support. You need, you need integrators. You need, you need um, consultants to help you make that transition and the big thing is you need to have a business problem that you're trying to solve. If you don't know what you're trying to solve, if you don't know what you're trying to fix, you can't go into industry 4.0. You need to know what you're trying to fix from a holistic standpoint. And then you need to be able to have the culture to make that change. Without that, it won't work. So it's as much as I want to do it as I'm ready to do it from an organization perspective. Yes, you're right, because I've been working with GE for almost three years and uh, I work in Dubai office and we've been actually involved in industrial digitalization for a quite long time. Uh, but the thing is, uh, you know, there was always a resistance. There was because, uh, you know, PLCs and DCS was not to actually initially supposed not to connect to Internet. Mm -hmm. And there was a huge fear, but when it comes to COVID-19, I see huge shift in, you know, thinking process, everybody, because nowadays the demand is actually to do the work sitting from home. And if you get into latest, uh, you know, trends in industry, industry digitization, industry 4.2, this is going to enable that. And that's why people are now not that much reluctant and they are actually them so like for example there are many folks who were saying that we are not interested and now they are contacting us back um to you know uh to open up uh, you know solutions and to provide them solutions that can actually enable them to work remotely with the less task force and uh, yeah that's that's a that's a great thing that is coming up but i hope uh, with with uh, what's been committed from industry 4.0 and industrial digitalization that should also fulfill because that industry need a maturity. What your what's your opinion that how long it's gonna take to actually have a very reliable 
industrial solution and what you think like do we have already in place 110 percent reliable solutions like that can actually reduce downtime and then that they can produce actually that can help uh, customers to uh, produce uh, more and with, with, with less cost what's your opinion about that uh, I, absolutely we have it yeah no 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 problem i mean it's it's it ex it exists it's out there um, Phoenix Contact can be part of that from from um, you know different different pieces to pull the different pieces together, but uh, the important thing is that you you have the problem that you have the 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 business problem that you're trying to uh, fix that you're trying to overcome, and then you get the right uh, artificial intelligence and these kinds of things, analytics to be able to help move you in that direction. One of the first ways to do that is to have the business problem. The second way to thing, the second thing you need to do is to make sure you're collecting that data and, and having that real time operations in a central area. And you're not making decisions about what that data is because you don't know what's gonna be needed in the future decision making process. So you get all of it in one central area. If you wanna record it, you kick it off to a historian, which is like a big database, but you have this real time data sitting there. And then you start to apply different types of um, analytics and, and operations to, to look at that, to, to really look at, okay, well, what are my problems? Okay, this, this line goes down every you know, five minutes for uh, restocking of the material. Okay, well, how can we augment that? You know, but you might not see that if you're not looking at the, the longer picture of what's going on with all the systems and you have the clear vision of, okay, well, I wanna increase my runtime of my machines um, from 50% to 70% or, or whatever, whatever your, your metrics may be. Mm -hmm. That's great. So um, that sounds awesome. I think we have uh, six more minutes and okay. then we would be getting into the questions and answers because I, I see a lot of questions coming up for sure. And uh, like, uh, I wanted to know what are the specific, like which industries you guys are trans, you know, trans you have your solution in place. Is it only oil and gas? You're in power or not specific to any industry. It's like for every industry, your solutions, because when it comes to uh, current digitalization era, um, you know, we have companies which are specialized in power. I see there are a few companies which are specialized in oil and gas. And I wanted to know what about you guys? What's your offering? So from a Phoenix contact perspective, we're definitely not um, industry. Well, we've have, we we have focuses in many industries. Um, we're not mm. focused in one particular area. And you got to remember um, that we have over thirty thousand parts from Phoenix Contact that go inside of industrial control cabinets. Many, many, many um, parts that go inside of industrial control cabinets. And those are things like um, terminal blocks, power supplies, relays, cables, and as well as ethernet switches, safety systems, wireless communications, fiber optic media converters, um, control systems, all these different kinds of things. So we have lots of different components and they're, they're designed to service many different areas. At the core, in our original foundation of our company, almost a hundred years ago, we were in electric power. And we made one of the very first terminal blocks. It was a ceramic terminal block that was designed for power. But since then, we've adapted and evolved and moved. And now we're in you know, power and oil and gas and heavy and, and factory automation. We deal a lot with OEMs that are servicing factory automation, um, pharma, uh, I, I, water, wastewater. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, even the areas of, of building automation that are maybe um, not quite as stringent and rugged as you would find in a process automation application. So there's a vast array of different types of things that we can do. And really anything that goes inside of that traditional control cabinet, we have to offer. So um, yeah, Sounds it's a very good. wide, <laughs> it's a very wide scope. Now, some of the areas that, um, you know, you brought up one thing I just want to point out, though, is I think one of the reasons you find those those very deeply integrated vertical niches is because, and you need to be a niche, is if you have a very tight end-to-end -end solution that does something really, really well. We have those as well, and we do have niches that we go complete down end-to-end, -end, but we service all of these markets 
particularly from a components perspective. If you think about it mm -hmm. from a leg, like, like you, if you think about it like Legos, right? Everybody can identify with Legos. We make a ton of different Legos. And mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we deal with system integrators and machine builders that make Lego sets. So if you want the latest Star Wars set or Harry Potter set, we have great integrators and great partners that can put all of our Legos together to make you an awesome set. Um, but we don't necessarily make all those sets from top to bottom where we only focused on this particular niche or this particular niche. And as you can tell, I have four young kids. So everything in my world revolves around things like Legos. So that's why I use that analogy. Okay. So uh, I want you to know like what's in, in plan uh, for our audience, like what's in your mind, which are the topics, because we had a discussion we would be because this is just a generic discussion. We didn't get into details of, uh, you know, solutions provided by Phoenix Contact. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I wanted to know uh, what's in line, what are the topics that we are going to discuss in future? And like uh, for sure, we would love to see you back and forth on here on IT and Automation Academy's YouTube channel so that everybody here is actually aware of what's needed in industry. And uh, like might be we, we we can get into the PLC next solution later on and we can just try and uh, do some of the simulation. Maybe we can make a uh, short tutorial videos on that. Mm -hmm. But for sure, uh, what's in what's in it, it's what exactly you have in your mind in uh, in future pod, podcast or uh, live sessions? Yeah. So first of all, I would say if there's things that come up that we see that are big trends in, in the in the Q and A that's happening here, I haven't been watching it, but we'll we'll see what's there. I would be happy to dig in in any of these areas. Um, I really enjoy these these types of conversations, and yeah, we're talking about PLC next and things, but it's also what's happening in the industry and what's hap you know happening um, whole, uh, from an overarching standpoint. I, I enjoy this this type of uh, conversation. So, but particular things that I would really like to dig into are definitely PLC next. I mean, it's it's a big part of where we're going. From a Phoenix Contact perspective, there's a there's a lot going on in the industry, and uh, and I believe this is a really important important part of a lot of companies' digital transformation. But it's only a part, but it's an important part, and it really does unlock a lot of capabilities. And then we can go on and we can talk about many other things um, that that can relate to that. Because uh, there's a host of products that Phoenix Contact has and technologies, um, cellular communications, cybersecurity is a big topic, managed versus unmanaged infrastructure and what that means. Because in a lot of cases, I find that a lot of people um, from the OT space that are on the factory floor and dealing with control cabinets don't understand necessarily what some of the needs are of the IT space. And we need to bridge these gaps more and more. We don't need to be afraid of IT. We need to embrace IT. And we just need to understand how to speak that language sometimes. So these are other areas that we could dig into as well. So I think sky's the limit. Great. So uh, now we are getting into your questions. And uh, please write your questions because we are going to address maximum number of the questions possible. And so the first question we have here, I'm first, I am first year electrical engineering uh, guy. What are what are beginner steps for learning industry 4.2? Yeah, so what I would do is definitely, um, you know, just you need to dig in a little bit on the, on the research side to kind of understand like things like this and understanding, you know, what it is high level. Then get started with with some protocols like MQTT. Um, understand how that works, how things move around. Um, that's going to be a good pathway to just understand how to move data. But the other big thing is you. You just need to look at, in general, what's happening on on the factory floor, and and how can you get data from either a enabled end device like PLC Next that can get that data directly to a local namespace, or how can you enable other data, things like an existing Rockwell, Siemens, Schneider, Omron, whatever PLC that's already on the factory floor. How do you get that data? to a namespace. You know, there's different types of gateways, different types of operations. But really focusing in on that foundation there is, is a good way to do it. Um, and then there are different communities out there um, that can help you along that way as well. If you if you look into like LinkedIn, for example, I know there's some 4.0 communities that are out there that that can help drive you along that path. Great. So uh, I think most of the, and we got a similar question, but we have already answered that. 
Uh, let's get into another question. Oh, mm -hmm. Question is actually Internet of Things shall be uh, considered as a subnet of Industry 4.0, and what are the core differences between these two? Yeah, that's a good question, and I think it'll vary um, between any of the industry experts that you, you talk to, and I'll have my opinion, and I'm sure the next guy will have his opinion, and I think we're all right. Um, so um, I see IoT as kind of like a, a bigger umbrella and Industry 4.0 being a piece of that. So um, Industry 4.0 is about the digital transformation. It's about um, making that digital twin. It's, it's about getting the data and making use of that data on a factory floor. I see IoT or IIoT as the overarching piece of from, from the top to the bottom, really looking at um, the, like more of that open architecture piece that I spoke about on the edge, that's going to be an, a really important topic there where in industry 4.0, that may not be as needed because it's more focused on the data, the modeling, making use of that data. IIoT is more of a holistic view where it goes beyond the data and looks at the other pieces around it. Um, that would be, they're very closely related, but that would be uh, what my opinion is on IIoT versus Industry 4.0, more data and, and and core, and IIoT is is wider scoped where it includes the edge devices, what this means, how to communicate, um, the hardware you use, the open architectures, the, the the requirements that you need for that for that hardware. Great. So next question we have: What are the safety precautions has been taken for remote control through PLC Next? Yeah. So. Um, the PLC next, and the, actually the standard escapes me right now. Um, I think I saw Phil was in the chat. Maybe he can help me out with this. I don't know. But um, it's, the it's PLC next is actually developed with safety to the core. There's actually an ISA standard that is, uh, and I, that the number is escaping me right now, but that is um, set so that the way we actually develop the product is in accordance with that safety standard. And that's a really important topic for how this thing is in its in its uh, in its entirety there locally as a, as a controller. Um, the other thing, though, is uh, you say remote control through PLC Next. Um, I, I don't know if you're referring to like how you actually access it. So when you access it, it is uh, you, you do use secure communications. It's encapsulated data, whether it be locally or if you do it remotely, you can of course use VPNs. Um, it's a, it's a very secure way to. Uh, secure the information that's that's going to the device. But this is a whole separate topic, um, but you, then you can look at how you secure infrastructure as a whole, because part of it, of course, is having this device be secure. And this is inherently secure in its operation, but you need defense in depth. It's a classic security procedure because you can't fix everything. The product can be perfect in terms of security, but you do have operators, you do have manual interaction, you do have other ways that could potentially create vulnerabilities. So you need to make sure you're protecting different cells of your operation. And you do that through uh, different types of router and, and different types of, of firewalling uh, and, and other types of VPN access to make sure networks and, and different components or even machines in a line are, are potentially separated. So is uh, the next question we have is, is Phoenix Contact has any product catering to em emerging technologies like EV battery charging or smart grid technologies? Yeah, so um, we definitely are in this space. So um, when you look at that space, though, we're not actually making the batteries. What we're doing is we're servicing the people that are making the batteries. So um, in, in those types of operations and applications, and we're actually as a company, very big in the, in the EV battery charging space, particularly uh, the connectors for the cars. Um, we're one of the major providers of both the inlet and the plug connectors. It's actually a big part of our business and it's growing very rapidly. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to see where that, that goes. And then, so that's on the, uh, that's on the car side and the, and, the, and the servicing side. But then you look at all the manufacturers of batteries and those kinds of things. Absolutely, it's a classic way where we, we, we live with a lot of these different types of uh, um, applications with all of the different types of components we have to help those types of processes. So the next question we have, uh, I wanted to know about temperature monitoring controlling products remotely. Uh, I mean, like, that's the question. 
we have. Mm -hmm. but... So um, I, actually, so going back to one of the other questions about Industry 4.0 and how do you get started, um, looking at monitoring and controlling um, different types of or temperature could could be a good way to get started if you you get something as sophisticated as a PLC Next controller, or you get something as simple as a Raspberry Pi and and connecting a you know a thermistor to it to start monitoring temperature, and then maybe you publish that through MQTT and you set up your own little network and and how to move data around. Um, that would be a great operation. So how do you do that? Well. It depends on which control platform you're using. If you're using something like PLC Next, um, it, it's certainly capable. We have a particular module, an I.O. module. You can add right to it, and uh, you can do analogs or digitals or whatever it may be, and one of those could, could be a, a temperature module. So you can incorporate um, you know, a thermocouple or a, a thermistor or an RTD um, to, to monitor that. So we have... a. Uh... Another comment, actually, that is uh, in terms of remote connectivity, Phil is saying that PLC Next controller has onboard firewall and level of config configurable administration. So that's adding to the same thing. And I, yeah, I think that's uh, another thing we have uh, is IEC six two double four. That's the standard. That's the standard that I that I that I couldn't yeah. remember. So thank you very much. So we are getting questions. Again, I would like to uh, have your thoughts on OPC technology-based communications and MQTT. Yep. That's a, that's a tough question. Um, I, it's really a matter of preference. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, okay. I, I'm a big fan of OPC communications locally. I think it does a great job at, at communicating information in a, in a local cell and local operations. And MQTT is such a lightweight protocol that it really does allow the, the communications um, to a, a general namespace to be uh, just less taxing on the infrastructure, less taxing on the network, particularly if you use uh, um, a well, you should really be using something like a Spark Plug B variant of it. That way, you know where all the data is and, and the, the data map, and, and there's a little bit more standardization to what it looks like. But overall, for that large amount of data moving and, and the report by exception and these kind of things, um, the MQTT is going to be good for that higher level. And then OPC UA is definitely, or OPC or OPC UA could be very good for localized communications. You could also use MQTT down as well but that's where I would see them. It is definitely a big debate. Um, there's lots of different uh, ways to slice and dice this. Um, there's arguments, there's good arguments for both areas. That's where I would be in architecting a system. Great, so um, like I just wanna add one thing. I think uh, we don't have any, uh, any further questions at the moment, unless we have. So I wanted to add, uh, Anybody who wanted to actually learn, uh, especially industrial digitalization and uh, Industry 4.0, you need to start working with, that's my understanding, you need to start looking into control side first. If you have a clear understanding about PLCs, DCS, then you are good to go for any industrial digitalization connectivity or any other like AWS cloud, you know, system provider related, you know, job because you need to start for sure with controls and then you have to look into other options, which are like you have to start with looking into communication protocols. At least if you're not aware about complete DCS, you should be having a beginner knowledge, and then you should have a clear understanding about different communication protocols that exist, like Modverse, you need to get into OPC, OPC UA, OPC DA, MQTT, and some other protocols, because uh, like you need to know about Pi, Pi Historian, and there are many things that are really, really very vital for you in a communication part, and then Later on, you need to get into cloud side. If you got time, you need to learn AWS. You need to learn, uh, like Azure is also one of the good. I'm not underestimating Azure, but I'm a huge fan of AWS. 
that's why i'm advertising that but there is no paid advertisement to be honest guys so it's like my personal liking aws i like it i'm i started with it and i'm doing it so i uh, i myself started with plcs initially then i learned hmi scada dcs and i get into you know then uh, like i got a chance working in industrial digitalization uh, i learned scada i learned uh, also like uh, you know industrial digitalization and connectivity how you connect your data from uh, plant floor controllers like plc and dcs to the cloud and then make sure the you know information is available there that's one part of it another part is to have a data science information like if you are you wanted to get a good job uh, and you are quick you know in learning especially statics related stuff you're good in that you really need to get into data science it's totally depend on what you like and where you want to head into and then you have analytic side where you need to get into python and other coding languages to get these things sorted out but yeah uh, that's the way out you if someone want to start with industry 4.0 or industrial digitalization related stuff then this is the way to start with that's an ideal way i don't uh, i don't say anybody is like i didn't see uh, everybody is doing same thing. I see some of the folks who start with the com communication protocols and the connectivity state forward. That's again possible, but that will not make you an expert feeling. What I mean, what I mean by an expert, expert is someone who get in and make his architecture ready in a just a click. So that's the way. Actually, uh, I just wanted to highlight to the questions that we have. I think we got three of similar questions, so that's why I get into that. So getting into the next question we have, I, I am an undergraduate of instrumentation engineering. What courses should I do? Well, I, so think I, I, just, I think yeah. I explained everything here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so can you, yeah, can you talk about uh, the next question is processor architecture inside of the device? Yeah, I think we, we have similar thing in line in coming days. So. Yep we would be definitely doing it in future so uh, we would definitely talk about inside details my yeah. question if somebody wanted to learn plc next what are where is uh, you know information available and from where they get that actually information because i, I might see many of the folks wanted to learn more about plc next yeah is there so any I simulator yeah. Yes. Yeah, so one of the best places to go is the uh, the PLC Next community. Um, mm -hmm. So if you just Google PLC Next community, there's there's a great community page that's building up. Um, it's hosted by Phoenix Contact, but it's uh, it's it's a community of users that have come together, and there you can find all kinds of of news and informations about the product. Um, you can you can really step out from from there and all these other ways. Um, so that would be a, a good place to start. The other thing is, um, you know, you can always talk to your local uh, Phoenix contact representative. Um, I do have um, for the the area manager for Pakistan um, on the uh, the the screen here. I don't know if you can pop that up. Yeah. Um, so. Um, he, he can help you out there locally in that, that area. And we do, of course, have subsidiaries around the world because I know we have an international audience here. Um, again, I'm out of the, the US. You can contact me for anything and I can route you to wherever you need to go. But anything um, in that area that's you would want to talk to Fahad and um, he can help you navigate any of those areas. But online as a quick, easy resource and a great way to kind of get some, some starting points is the PLC Next community. And there is a growing number of, of uh, people that are creating different types of uh, content uh, regarding um, the, the how to get started with PLC Next and, and these kind of things that are outside of uh, Phoenix Contact. Um, so if you if you just look on YouTube and you look up PLC Next, you'll find a lot of products from like, um, there's a gentleman by the name of Raj that has a, I think it's like a 10 or 12 part series now on how to get started with PLC Next, particularly on like the node red side and these kind of things. Um, RealPars is another company that's really starting to come up and and develop some content and, and how to get started with PLC Next. And there's there's more and more people that are developing content in this way. 
Great. So good to have you in today's discussion, Era Shop. So we had a really nice discussion. I think we are ending towards the time limitation. And I know that you have a work in plan today. So you might need to work on that side. So our time is done and we we wanted to see you back and hope to see you back soon. And thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Great to great to talk to everybody here. And uh, um, you know, if you you want to have a further chat or anything else, you know, feel free to reach out to me on um, on LinkedIn. Um, that's probably the best place to reach me. Um, Iris Sharp Jr. is the uh, the slash after the uh, the LinkedIn post there. And yeah, um, thanks thanks a lot for your time. I really do appreciate great, it. So, thank you. Have a good day then. So uh, guys, I think it, it was a very nice session. What's your opinion? I wanted to have a chit chat with you guys right now because um, like, yeah, uh, we, we wanted to get um, most of the things actually sorted out. Uh, I wanted to know what, do you guys really want that kind of a sessions or you want a regular training sessions? Because it's in a time uh, I am normally doing pollings, but yeah, I would love to get your opinions on the chat right now. Yeah, please go ahead and ask anything like, and for sure, if you guys have any questions, you can ask still. But yeah, uh, what's your opinion of like, do you guys want that kind of a session back and forth to bring in industrial experts? And what are the domains that you wanted to hear? Uh, more because I know Industry 4.0, I picked it up and I bring many folks into that. And Airshop had a very good experience in that side. So that's why it was a very, very good uh, addition to bring him, uh, bring him in into a uh, live discussion. So um, I it really certainly helped us if in the case you hit the like button. And if you guys have any question, I would love to answer you guys because I have some more time, four or five minutes. And then, yeah, we thank you for a good session. And it is, yeah, thank you, man, for joining us. And uh, everybody would, would join us. And please hit the like button if you haven't, because it would enable uh, to get more reach to the more people at the moment. Uh, yeah, anyone from uh, Indonesia, um, anybody from Indonesia. And we got anybody from London, one comment. So guys, um, yeah, anybody from London, please post in. Uh, yes, I think now, I think it's important to understand the theoretical part, like how PLC work and what is, okay. Uh, for sure, I would, uh, that's a good question, by the way. Uh, it will love to actually make a content on that if you guys really want that uh, in future sessions. And uh, Javed Ali, thanks for uh, for your comment. I. I will take it as a consideration and we will love to do that. It's not important, is it? it's IoT important in industry? Yes, of course, because industry is heading towards that. IoT is really important with reference to Siemens PCS7 batch system. Yeah, I think PCS7 is also doing a tremendous job in, in, in like uh, when you talk about uh, latest softwares, yes. So thank you, brother. Very, very much um, appreciated from you guys. You've been part of that discussion. I request you to actually um, follow Airshop and his LinkedIn profile, uh, profile is Airshop, uh, JR, and you can just go ahead and just hit the follow button there. And if, by the way, if you, if you haven't followed me so far, what you're waiting for? You need to. And uh, yeah, I think we are really good to go. And things are set up and we will definitely get in contact later on. And those folks who haven't hit the like button, you really need to hit the like button. And we will catch you in the next amazing session about what are the future of, you know, uh, what are the, what is in future uh, of automation and that's in uh, one of the video that's in plan and we would have a very soon maybe tomorrow that video would be posted i appreciate if you hit the like button participate 
come in because that matters a lot thanks for watching this video till next session i hope everybody would be smiling and you really need to smile because smile is one of the things that makes you really unique because if somebody like sad face me like sad face like me would be actually talking to someone other person would be bored but if you are smiling then people will love to actually hear you talk to you so smiling is really important keep smiling and take care of your loved ones we'll catch you in the next one have a good day